My talk, yeah, I'm uh, Paul Fultz. My talk's about modern generic programming using the tick and fit libraries. So, um, d yeah, don't, don't switch yet, sorry. <laughs> uh, the tick and fit libraries are two libraries that, um, uh, that I've been uh, authoring here for possible inclusion in Boost later on. The tick library focuses on type traits and fit library focuses on function utilities. And kind of focus on this talk is about like basically how we can improve how these libraries can help simplify some of the stuff that uh, people do when they do generic programming. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, as a motivating example here, um, say for instance, this is just kind of a contrived example of um, maybe a library that does like a twice function and it calls another library function called increment, right? And uh, this is a kind of example, just a contrived example to see like kind of like what happens when we write generic code. So flip to the next slide. So say for instance the user calls this uh, with some foo type that doesn't actually have the increment operator. And so like the error message you get out here is this. And there's a couple pro a lot of times people talk about the template messages being much longer because sometimes you'll have much longer back traces as well as it grows. But one key important aspect about this is the fact that the error is actually inside the library code, which is a which is very confusing to the user of the library to know whether they've, they're the ones that are making the error or it's a, a mistake in the library. So first of all, it points to there and then I, yeah, ideally you get the, the backtrace. So flip to the next slide. So one of the ways we kind of um, fix that is using, uh, we try to specify some kind of type requirements or concepts that basically they are set up as a set of valid expressions that can be uh, performed on types. They're basically, they mainly focus on syntactic requirements, but they're kind of used to try to represent semantic requirements. Right now we use it to, uh, a lot of libraries just provide it as a documentation feature. So they'll just say like, hey, this library, if you call it with this generic function, here are the requirements you're allowed to use on it. But sometimes it's better to actually have the compiler check some of those type requirements. So one of the libraries in Boost actually provides Boost concept check that lets you specify these type requirements and check them as well. So if you, if going back to our case of using that incrementable, we could actually build a simple incrementable concept here using the Boost concept check library, and we can do the plus plus x here. And then if we go to the next slide, there, we can actually check the requirement for Boost concept or assert here. So this will actually check the, the type requirements for that. And ideally, the goal is to get better error messages. Um, but even though this looks much larger than the previous message, it has some actually very important information in it as well. One of the things is in the notes here, it actually shows that the type requirement, usage requirements have failed on there. So even though it even though you're still getting possibly error messages in the library code, you can actually see like, oh, but you're getting this, this message because of failed usage requirements. And this is kind of a library that's been used for many years to check type requirements in Boost. So um, uh, going on to the next slide. But there's a couple limitations to using Boost concept check. The first one is there's no overloading. So uh, overloading is something that's important. Sometimes when you've got hierarchy of, of concept checks, and so um, you can't really do that using directly doing the concepts that are defined in Boost concept check. And the second thing is, as you saw, it doesn't necessarily reduce the number of errors because it can't really key to the compiler that, hey, you, we failed type requirements, stop compiling. It, 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 it'll generally continue on compiling as well. So it doesn't really necessarily reduce the number of errors. So one of the future, uh, as Andrew talked actually earlier here at the conference about concepts like uh, future proposals in the language that we can actually specify type requirements. So we can actually do the same type of thing, define our in incrementable, and we define you know, a set of valid expressions that, that are, are required. And then when we want to check that, we just write requires incrementable t and it, then it will check the type requirements. And so when we look at the error message f using concepts light, we see, I mean, yes, it's much smaller, but one important factor is the error message actually points to the user code. So with the user actually failed the type requirement, so the first thing they see is they can't call that function. And then you get notes of why you can't call the function, mainly that the type requirements, incrementable foo, was not satisfied. So 
right now we're kind of in, in between the state between, um, you know, we've got concepts light, new features, and we've got boost concept check, and an older li library. But the tick library is, is a library that's, that I've been developing to try to provide something very close in current C++ to check type requirements. So it works around building type traits. So you build the type traits to check the type requirements. Um, and then one of the things that I am doing here, and you actually see in this talk, um, a lot of times in the standard library, or a lot of times when people refer to the concept, they usually name it like default constructible Pascal case. But the type trait in the library is generally named state case, like is default constructible. So a lot of times when I define the traits here in this talk, I mean, granted, people can name the traits however they want. Most of the time I follow this naming convention. So as we see on the next slide when we want to define our trait using the tick library, I define it using is incrementable with the name. And so this is a little macro here that takes care of some boilerplate. Now the tick library, um, it provides a mechanism so you don't, if, if, cause some people don't really like to use macros. So you, you can actually write the, this boilerplate yourself and not rely on the macros. Yes. When you use is incrementable all lower case, and there's a type trait by that name, which somebody might use inside some other meta function or whatever, but you've also used exactly the same name for your concept checking function, and how, how, how is it that those two don't get mixed up? And uh, obviously, the original, the way that they, they do it is it's got, it's got them different spellings so that you, you don't get them confused. And okay, the question is, is like how you would possibly get this naming confused with the concepts. But this actually defines an actual trait. So this, wor this is actual trait. That's why it's named like that. So this is not like uh, some special concept bool type of function template. This is actually a trait. Does that answer your question? So let me explain that make sure I understood. So in fact, you don't have special type trait to implement your concepts. You have some other machinery which takes the, 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 uh, any type trait and verifies it in the right, in the right place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the, so this basically, this... The, the macro, I don't, I don't show here without using the macro because it's, it's a little nicer using the macro, but basically all it does is this is a separate class that defines your requirements. And then you will call, then it, then the, then you can, when you want to build your is incrementable type trait, you can, you can create your regular type class is incrementable and you can say model of or models and then refer to this class and it will actually... No, this class here actually has a, a private name when you use the macro, or you can give it a different name. So you could define this. You could define this as capital incrementable, your class, and then you, you define your trait as, as incrementable. But most of the time you never use this class. So most of the time you can just treat it as an implementation detail. And so the macro takes care of naming it something that won't clash with this. Does that answer your question? Uh, or? I, I still don't get it, but I think it will be better to move on. And make okay. Okay, all right, okay. Why is the name Tick? Uh, it uh, stood Repeat for, the okay, what, what, why the name Tick? Uh, it stood for Trait Introspection Concept Creator. So it's kind of what it stood for. Um, that's why I chose the name Tick. Possibly I could change it to something else later in the future, possibly Boost Concept Trait or something like that. Um, but that's why the name was chosen. So. This basically sets up the trait. We define here a member function called require. And this is kind of built off of like Eric Nebler's ideas for that he has his range v3 library that defines the uh, concepts. So um, it uses using the trailing decal type. So we say require, that's going to be our first parameter. And then we use this valid template here. And then we list out decal type uh, and for each of the expressions that we want to verify is valid. And so then if we go to the next slide, we want to use that trait. We just say is incrementable t inside of this tick requires very similar to concepts light, and then it will it, it'll actually check it. This is kind of macro around uh, enable if, and so if we want to see what happens with our error messages using the tick library, first of all, it's very similar. We get an error. We get the error message inside the user code, so it actually points to there, and then we get a note why it failed, which is basically disabled by enable if or the type traits failed, and it actually points to the um, requirements clause. So we get that information. 
Um, going further, looking at some other capabilities that you can actually do when you're defining your traits. One thing you can do, you can define refinements on it. So say for instance we wanted, we think default constructability is important as a simple example. We can actually create a refinement on top of is default constructible. And uh, we'll see more later on in the talk why this is important. But when we define our refinements, we actually define it using a placeholder syntax, like very similar to, is anybody familiar with boost MPL placeholder expressions? Okay. So basically, it will replace, when it replaces this type in, it will replace that with, the, with this, uh, what is called unnamed placeholder. Also, you can use named placeholders as well. So like, say for instance, we're doing an equal, uh, uh, checking equality. We can actually, maybe we want to check for both, because we have two parameters, we want to check that both are there. So in this case, we'll do underscore one, underscore two. And, and so this here, x, the type of x will be replaced with underscore one, and the type of y will be replaced with the uh, underscore uh, two. Yes? Would you be able to use both of those with just the unnamed placeholder? The problem if you use the unnamed placeholder, oh, sorry, he asked if you could use both of them uh, using the unnamed placeholder. Um, it wouldn't really make sense because when you use the unnamed placeholder, it first says it's one, and if there's a second one, it says it treats it as two. So if you used it for both of the uh, unnamed placeholder there, it would actually just check that the first one twice is default constructible. So in general, it, it wouldn't make sense. Does that make sense? So, so that's, that's some of the things you can do with the refinements. Also, you can actually check what it returns as well. So going back to the is equality comparable, we can actually check here that this expression actually returns bool. And when it checks that it returns bool, it works very similar to concepts like it actually checks that it's convertible to bool as well um, in the same manner. Um, we can also uh, check, for example, say for instance, uh, because you can use fundamental types and if, if expressions, I mean, this is probably a bad idea, but you could actually check that this actually returns a, a fundamental type. So you can actually pass a trait into the returns. You can use the placeholder expressions to check against it. And you can do the same thing like, as, like if you wanted to do like to check if it is an exact match, you can just do the is same uh, type trait and just do underscore, comma, whatever type you want. So this will actually check that the return type meets those requirements of that. Um, also on top of it, you can do checking for types and templates as well. So uh, yeah, you can just do has type and it does checking for type and has template. You can check for the template. I don't show it on these slides, but you can also check, uh, you can check requirements on that type as well if you check for, when you check for nested types. So. Um, and then when you check requirements, we kind of saw this already, right? When you do requires um, and it checks is incrementable. And basically that expands to, this expands to an enable if, but it also does some other stuff so that it doesn't have to be uh, a dependent type here when you actually check the requirements, which is actually useful when you want to check member requirements. And so this is just a shortcut of template tick requires, but basically you can say member requires check that, 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 that this member function will only exist if T meets those requirements. So you can do that as well. So, and then finally, another place where you can check requirements, and the reason why it's a separate macro is it, you kind of have to do something slightly different, is you can actually check the perimeters. And this is actually useful when you're doing lambdas. And we'll see more of this usage later, why you will do this. But basically, you'll say here, uh, basically prim requires put in here, we have to do the decal type here, which sometimes could be a little verbose. So instead, what you can do is you can say, trait is incrementable and pass in the variable here and it will go ahead and deduce that type for you and then check the requirement. So um, now looking at some of the differences between concepts light and my library, right? Uh, my library is actually built a lot around um, the type traits. So it inter 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 operates really well with those. So we can actually do easily do refinements on top of a type trait. We can also, with the returns, we want to check that, you know, this returns is a fusion sequence. You know, some level trait, trait, type trait defined in the fusion library. We can easily do that as well. Um, when you're using concepts light, um, you can do refinements on type traits, but you can't do, if you want to check the returns, you've kind of have to funnel it through another concept bool 
to be able to do that. So, uh, the next thing uh, with the tick library, you can do specialization on the traits. Concepts Light doesn't provide specialization, and there's there's a lot of valid reasons why they don't provide those. But basically, specialization is important because it, a lot of times what happens is your type implicitly uh, implements the requirements for the concept, and and though it is all syntactic requirements, it may not be necessarily re meet, meet the semantic requirements that you're wanting. So in those cases, we, when you run into um, uh, ambiguity in that, you may want uh, to be able to explicitly opt out of it, and specialization provides that mechanism. And it's also very important when it's involved with overloading, because one, concept checking doesn't actually allow for specialization either. either. But it's generally not a problem because um, because if, if there was a false positive of a boost concept check, because boost concept check doesn't allow overloading, you would just be like, all right, I won't call this function. I just get a worse error, or it sex faults when I call it. It doesn't, you know, um, you know, I'll just avoid it. But the thing is, when you're involving overloading, you may want to call one of those functions in the overload, and if it picks the wrong one, um, that becomes a major problem, and you w specialization will allow for you to verify that information so that it calls the correct one. And this is especially important with unconstrained templates involved because the detecting could be like, well, this implements it, but come to find out it's actually a static assert when you, when you call the function. So this, and as an example, like a year ago, if you tried to, using Boost Data Rater Library, you tried to implement um, like, it had, uh, like an STD advanced using purely like a concept-based approach, it would actually fail on Boost Data Rater because all of the operators defined by boost data rate at the time were all unconstrained. So it would all say, oh, well, it's all random access, and it would try to call the random access, when really your iterator was only forward iterator at the time. So specialization does come uh, uh, into play with a lot of things, especially when working with legacy libraries. Another important aspect versus concepts light versus tick. Concepts light is just basically a raw Boolean value. But tick actually uses dependent typing because it's an integral constant with the type trait. And basically what dependent typing is, is it encodes the value into the type. But it has some really nice, pro most of the time it's used in other languages to do like theorem proving and other things like that. But it's actually really useful in C++ to provide cleaner mechanisms to do a lot of thing, a lot of metaprogramming aspects. And as a simple example here, like if we wanted to filter out a tuple, and we wanted to filter it out based on certain type traits, we can actually write code like this, pass into our filter just a regular lambda predicate, where traditionally if you use Boost Fusion to do this, you actually pass in like a placeholder expression with a like, or over it, and it, it can start to get really nasty really quick, quickly. So doing this, having dependent typing, we can just write it using natural syntax. Um, to be able to do this using concepts light, you would have to either wrap the the concept bool into an integral constant is one way. Uh, another way of doing it is you could overload the lambda and put into the requires so that you have two overloads, one that return std true type and one return std false type. I think this is much cleaner though. Um, so another aspect uh, that's different is in because the traits like, oh sorry. Uh, you, you just press the up arrow. No, sorry. It's actually the up. Uh, just hit. Oh. oh, here. I'll go back. Uh, no. That's not it. Uh, go to the beginning, sorry. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Okay. On, okay, what are you... Okay. So what you're doing here is like the default constructor is integral default of x, right? Yeah. And you use the or or filter on that. So well, this was uh, okay. He's asking a question. Well, he just made a comment about how this statement works here. But the way this works here, this um, and this actually does compile. This is integral is one I actually define, and it actually uses the the integral constant that's in the tick library because it defines extra operators to be able to do or here? Is that, is that what yeah, your question about? Question was simply, like, do you use the integral constant? Or do you 
it, it's yes. It, the question was if, if I use std integral constant, and it inherits from std integral constant, and I provide extra operators here so that you can do this like more naturally in the library. So uh, the other thing is first class citizen. Classes are first class citizens, and that's the way type traits are actually defined. In concepts light, they're currently defined as either function template uh, or variable templates. And so they, you can't pass them to other things. So like when we saw earlier how you can do the trait is incrementable. I pass this trait into another function and be able to do like higher order operations on that. And that's not really possible using concepts like currently, but it is possible using the traits. Now, overloading. And this is the big difference between uh, concepts light versus tick. Overloading. Uh, in concepts light, it uses a process of subsuming. So when you have two different concepts with overloading, it, it, it uses that to figure out which is the most refined um, uh, overload to call. And to do the similar thing using tick, you use tag dispatching. So looking at a simple example of using overload, uh, we'll look at the can canonical example using STD advance, right? Um, basically, we want to overload on the different ones to do like, you know, forward iterators done in ON and random access iterators done in 01. So, um, uh, so to define the type requirements here using uh, concepts light, uh, I don't find the full iterator concepts, just what I need here for the STD advance because it's a much more complicated process to define and it wouldn't fit on the slide. So we just kind of define basic you know, incrementable. We also check the return type is also like, you know, returns itself here. Then when we define de decrementable, we actually refer to incrementable here as well as then put new requirements on it. Same way here, decrementable will add new requirements. And by doing that, it can actually subsume when we do the overloading. So looking at example, when we overload, like the advance here for each single one, if we pass in like an iterator to vector, it actually implements all three of these requirements but because of the way we wrote those to refer to the other ones, it will actually know that this is actually the more refined one, and it will actually pick that one, and it won't be an ambiguous overload. So, um, so you can do something very similar in tick as well. We can define the type requirements here, and then instead of referring it to in the require thing, we use uh, we we write the re uh, requirements explicitly. So we just use a placeholder expressions here and refer to is incremental and is decrementable, right? But when we want to overload, we use tag dispatching, right? And when we define those refine refinements, it actually will create a tag hierarchy for us. So we don't have to go in and actually implement the tag hierarchy. All we need to do in our function is write tag and put the name of the trait here. So we can say tag is advanceable, tag is incrementable here. And, and then when we want to grab those hierarchy for when we're checking it, here at the bottom we say most refined is advanceable. And then that will actually kick off the tag dispatching. We also check the lowest requirement, because this, this checks the highest requirement, right? But you also need to check the lowest requirement here, because if you don't, you'll get a, you'll get a thing where it says there's no overload available here in the impl, because there's no tag that goes, that, that exists for that. So instead of having longer uh, backtrace, we check the, the minimal requirement for is incrementable. So that's how you do it with tag dispatching. Now, there's actually another way we can actually do overloading as well. Um, and uh, the fit library is a library that provides functioning utilities, and it provides some other utilities for doing overloading. So before we jump into how we can do the overloading, I just want to kind of introduce the fit library and some of the basic constructs um, that we're going to use here in our talk for it. So the fit library is built around function objects uh, with a lot of things. And regularly when you create a function object, this is not using fit library at all, but basically when you create a function object, it's really important that you statically initialize that, that function object here. Because if you don't statically initialize it, you will, um, you can run into, you know, the static initialization order fiasco kind of thing that happens when you do it at runtime. This ensures that it gets initialized at compile time, and so you can use it anywhere. And so, yeah, and then once we initialize it, we can just call someone too, right? We can also, using the fit library, we can also initialize lambdas, right? So, 
here's a, uh, using this little macro here, we can do fit static lambda, and that lets that lambda, it doesn't make the lambda const expert, but it lets that lambda be initialized in a const expert context. And this relies on some uh, ternary trick from Richard Smith so that you can actually deduce the type of the lambda in, in a, a const expert context. And then it relies on the fact that the lambda's, the lambda's always empty to be able to const expert initialize it. Just to clarify, so, so the fit static lambda isn't itself const expert, but it can initiate a const expert variable? No, the question was uh, that the lambda, what, what, how, how do you uh, say it again? I, I, I just got, I got confused by you saying that it wasn't, it's not actually a const expert lambda, but it can. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it lambda. is not a const expert lambda. Right? Even though I put the context for here, it only initializes it. So the, think of the lambda, you can think of it like a function object. The constructor gets initialized at compile time, right? But the lambda is not. So like if you, you can't call this lambda function in a const expert context. Is that clear? So one of the other important aspects with the uh, fit library is adapters, right? So it provides all these new enhancements and capabilities that you can actually add to functions. And um, we, we can look at some of the capabilities of that. One really simple example um, that uh, this is kind of just for uh, like eye candy is doing the pipeable one. So we could actually take our sum here, add the pipeable adapter to that function object here, and then we can actually just pipe one into the sum instead. So it kind of works like, a, like, a, like extension methods as well. The other thing we can do is we can also do the function form of it. So we can actually do pipeable and define it as a, a lambda as well, right? But sometimes putting, when you have a lot of lambdas, putting this fit static lambda all over the place can get kind of messy. So what you can do, it actually, the fit library provides fit static function. So you can actually, you can just define it here and then we can just define the pipeable and the lambda here and we have our pipeable function, right? But more importantly, what I want to discuss here about what we can do with overloading is another process where we can avoid like the ambiguous overloads when we're dealing with multiple concepts is conditional overloading. Sometimes people call it like linear overloading or other things like that because essentially the first function that it can actually find that it, it can actually call, it will actually call that function. So in the process of where you have two traits that are two functions that actually are are actually viable, callable, but you know, it usually generally ends up being ambiguous. In this case, it's never ambiguous because it always picks the first one. So going back to our advanced example here, this is not this is not real C code, right? But you can think of conditional overloading in these terms or, or when we want to implement advance, right? We could think of it as terms of, oh, if it's advanceable, do this. Else if it's Decrementable have this, else if it's incrementable, do that. And so that's kind of the way the conditional overloading works in that way. It's kind of a way of doing like static if. So actually doing it using the conditional adapter, right? We just say conditional up here and then we put our conditional statements right here in the param requires for each lambda. And so basically when we call this here, it first will check A. If it's advanceable, that matches, it calls this. If it's decrementable, that matches, it calls that. And then if it's incrementable, finally would be the last one it would try to call. And then if it couldn't call that, it would say that the function wasn't callable, right? So going on to another more sophisticated example, uh, looking at like a comparison between concepts light and conditional overloading, because um, there are some differences between um, some advantages, I, I think, using tag dispatching because your hierarchy order is always, is always defined in one place where with conditional overloading, you gotta make sure you all, whenever you overload based on those concepts, you put those in the same order. But there are some advantages to using um, conditional overloading, I think, especially when you're dealing with things that, that could possibly overlap. So say for instance, we wanted to implement a generic print function that recursively outputted values. And say for instance, uh, we wanted to work over ranges, fusion sequence, boost variant, and streamable. But there's a couple problems here, one, there are cases like, say, for instance, using boost array that's both a range and a fusion sequence as well. Also, uh, fusion sequence and variant provide the streamable operators, so those are actually streamable as well. So there's some overlap with these as well. But these are a lot of these traits are not 
like related as well. So if you wanted to implement this as using concept light, we could actually start looking at how we could implement the traits here. So we could define our streamable trait, right? Check if it says a streamable operator. Then we can define our iterator, right? Make sure it's you know it's copyable, destructible, and and dereferenceable. And then here we can actually check a range and check uh, this ADL begin and ADL end just calls the as stood begin stood end using ADL lookup instead. And we make sure that that returns back iterator, right? So then when we want to implement um, it using concepts light, another thing here I put up at the top is for string is because string actually is a range as well. But we don't want to print uh, the string as a range, just where it prints, you know, the element on every single line. Rather, we want to print the whole string together. So we put a function up here. Next, we for declare all these functions here first, because because we're doing this recursively, and these other functions may call all these other functions. You need to have the name available first in C++ for it to find the function, unless you're using Visual Studio, and it will find it for you. But um, but in standard C++, the, the name up looks requires you to put the, the names first. So first, we have to forward declare, and this actually goes off the, down off the screen, it's been on the slide. But first, um, to deal with the issues, like say for instance, we want to do fusion sequence, right? Or well, I'm sorry, range here, we check the requirement for range. But then for fusion sequence, right, we'll actually negate range here, so that to avoid the ambiguity between fusion sequence and range. We add an overload for boost variant, but since this is most specialized, we don't have to worry about negating any other traits with it. Uh, the compiler will automatically pick that as the most specialized. Then for, um, uh, for the streamable one, right? we actually check to make sure it's streamable. And then because a fusion sequence and even a range can also be streamable as well, we actually make sure we negate this one as well. And then, um, I don't know. I don't know if you guys want to see the rest of it, but then it implements all these functions down at the bottom that refers to the top one. But you can kind of see here, it just loops over it, calls print recursively, which could, if, so if this is like a range of tuples, it'll call the print, then call the fusion sequence version, and kind of just recursively go over it. So that's the way the concept light work. Um, we can do a very similar thing to finding the traits actually using the tick library, right? We can you know, define the stream here, define the ref refinements there and the return types, make sure that the begin and end return something that is an iterator, right? And then when we want to define it using the fit library, right, we can actually take advantage of some other advantages when we're doing it recursively. First of all, we use this thing called fix here. And um, I don't know how many people are familiar with a fix combinator. But basically what a fixed combinator does is it, it's when you want to define a recursive function, it passes itself back in as the first parameter to the function. So when we want to call it back recursively, we don't have to worry about name ordering and things like that. We can actually just use fix to do it as well. The next thing we do is conditional um, over here so that all we need to do is order our functions in the right order and we don't actually have to negate any of the any of the um, other traits right here. Because I put range here first and I put sequence here, right? So I know if I make it here, I know it's not a range. So there's no amb ambiguity in this case. And then same way down here, if I make it the streamable, then I know none of these items are streamable as well. So, um, or, or, or rather, none of, none of these requirements were met. So streamable is the only one left that, that can meet it. And then we just call the self, which is, refers back to itself using the fixed point combinator. So that, that provides a much, I think, a cleaner way of dealing with it. And the conditional overloading matches more of generally, f when, especially when you're doing like serialization stuff like this, matches more of how you think about um, your logic f uh, of overloading on the different requirements. So yes? What does uh, fit result do? OK. Yes. What does fit result do? So here? When I call apply visitor, it needs a result type that has the uh, that tells it what the result type is. In our case, our result's always going to be void. So what result void does is it basically takes this function, adapts it so that it has a result type of void when boost variant calls it, so it can know what the return type is. So, any other questions? So another thing we can do 
with conditional overloading and with the lambdas is we can actually embed sometimes type requirements directly into the lambdas itself. So this function here is a fi fine iterator that works kind of in a smarter way. So starting at the bottom, right, we, get, we just call sdefine begin and end on it. And then it, 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 it uses sdefine to search the, the iterator to find uh, it. Then up from here, we call the member function, right? And we know it has a member function is valid because when we put the decal type r.find here, like this actually constrains that lambda. So because it does that, then this will only work if r.find works. And if that doesn't work, then it calls this version down here. But unfortunately, find, like say runs on string, is completely, uh, it doesn't return a, an iterator. So we basically have then another overload up here for string that basically calls the find and then maps it over from a, an index to an iterator, right? But on top of it, this is going to be kind of closed. What happens if you run into something else that you want to customize it? Do you want it, want it to be searchable? Or, um, or maybe a, you have another case of somebody's wrote another class that has a, a dot find method and it returns an index instead of iterator. Well, what you can do up here is this one up at the very top just calls the global find rx. So basically it will call the find and tries to find it through ADL lookup. If, it, if it's found through ADL, ADL lookup, it will call this one first. Otherwise, it will call the other logic here. So you have like, you have a customization point when you do this. So this system is not completely closed when you're doing when you're doing it. Because sometimes when you're finding this, like if you want to add new overloading to the conditional overloading, you can't do that. But with this, yes, you can if you do ADL lookup at the at the top of the conditional overloading with that. So next thing, errors, right? What kind of errors? So a lot of this, you know, you see the slides on here, it looks all really nice and stuff, but you know what happens when you put something in there that's wrong, right? Um, those, are, those are something really important. So looking at first, originally when you use conditional uh, overloading, like for example, when you're using conditional overloading for advance, originally it would give, uh, in, in the fit library, it would give an error message like this. So it's, it's nice and short. It still gives an error message in the user code, right, to tell them, like, hey, you've messed up. But the note here gives almost no information at all, useful information at all, for the user to figure out what, what went wrong, right? So, um, you, so I've done some improvements using a reveal adapter to try to actually go down and, and bring out the, the substitution failures that, that can happen. So now, Using the reveal adapter, right, you can get information such as um, it shows you the lambda and the line number at each function, right, that it failed, and you can go see that and figure out why your function failed. It's a slight improvement, but it's still not good enough. So I have a patch for Clang that basically goes in and, and improves this, this area. It's not, it's not been merged in yet, but basically what this does here is when we look at this now, we can actually see, oh, here's a requirement here. It's not advanceable. It's not decrementable. It's not incrementable. So it has all the information right there so the user can see, like, okay, here's why my type failed the requirements. And right now, it's, um, it's not been merged in with Clang because they're not sure if this is a, a better approach because um, the, this, this causes the uh, bottom up approach for when you want to actually diagnose the trace. So you actually start at the bottom and work your way up, which I think is better. But I don't, some people on Clang are not quite sure if that's the better approach than doing the top-down approach. Yes? Did you only check the wait, outputs in Clang or did you do GCC or I only checked right now with Clang. Yeah, GCC doesn't give you quite good error messages and the newer versions have gotten worse with reporting things like this. So um, hopefully in the future they will actually improve these error messages. But right now, I don't know GCC 5 if they've improved this, but I know that in if they still don't, it, they still don't tell you where your type requirements are. And then also it doesn't, I, it may give you a little bit more information from the previous slide, information with Clang, but it still, it still require, it still needs a lot of improvement, but it's, but yeah. Um, so, so using that, we can actually see, okay, our, my type requirement failed, but you know, I thought it was an advanceable type requirement. You know, I have a plus equal operator there, 
why is it not meeting the type requirements, right? So the, the tick library provides this thing, the trait check here. And what it does is it, it will actually look through all the refinements and report back all the things that failed along the way. So that way, if there's some small requirement, like, oh, it's not copy constructible, it's not copy assignable, it can actually tell you those details. It doesn't, it still doesn't tell you the detail for each of the expressions that went wrong. Um, and there's some difficulty with that, obviously, because we have a lack of backtrace for substitution failures. Uh, originally, GCC gave you a backtrace for substitution failure, but now in the newer versions, they've taken it, that away. So it's gotten a lot worse. So basically, what you need to do is when we do, when it does those requires and decal types, it needs to happen in a non spinet context, right? So you could actually define, this is something area that I'm working on possibly improving. You could define two functions that does the same exact thing inside the trait and maybe it could call out to the, the non-deduce one to get the more detail from the error message or possibly using a macro that would just duplicate both functions for you. I, would, I prefer not to try to use a macro for that, but I'm not, I haven't found like a better approach yet to do that. So. Yeah, to get the compiler report back the information. Okay, so another thing the compiler could actually help. So instead of the library actually doing it, just like I patched Clang earlier, um, like instead the compiler could actually build a tree of, uh, of all the, the substitution failures from the overload resolution and report back just basically like the leaf failures that happen so that you can actually get information about here's the important information that actually failed with your um, with your type tree, um, but it can actually go even further. So rather than having a separate step where you actually do all oh, uh, tick trait check this this uh, this thing, give me back this information. Instead, obviously the compiler knows where your constraints are at, and it can actually parse. I actually started work on doing this. It can fairly easily parse the Boolean expression, find out which trait failed, and actually report back like which exact trait fell instead of currently right now it just points and says it failed by enable if and it points directly to the enable if clause but instead when you have multiple constraints it could say okay it, it failed it's not incrementable with this type and it's not constructible with this type kind of thing and so but it can go even further because once it knows which trait actually failed and were false it, the compiler can then look at that uh, and then for the specializations that actually failed, it could actually start building a report the same way that it can build the report building that tree using overload resolution failures. It could build that same tree at the same time. So when it tells you, oh, it's not is incrementable, and the reason why is because you're missing a plus plus operator right here. So it could actually report back all that information already. Um, which this I don't work on playing, playing full time. So I don't know how long it will take me to eventually implement that, but these are goals that would be very nice for uh, the compilers to do currently um, with development. So the question is, I guess, we have all these, um, you know, it comes down to possibly a quality of implementation issue with the, uh, with the compilers, right? So the question is, do we really need a language feature to solve the diagnostic? Uh, thing and yes, we do need a language features. The first thing obviously no macros, right? Um, uh, I mean it, they help make it cleaner, but ideally It's b usually if you're using macros. It's usually a sign that you need a language feature for what you're doing so uh, The first off. Yeah, obviously we can get rid of the macros, but more importantly there's other stuff that cannot be possible, uh, even though we can do all this analysis and diagnostic to improve error reporting. We still can't, we, it's very, it would be very difficult to do multi-phase checking. And multi-phase checking enables a lot of things. First of all, we can actually, once we, we with multi-phase checking, we can analyze the template definitions to ensure that we actually meet the type requirements. So if we say, hey, this is going to be default constructible, and we end up calling the copy constructor on it, you know, like that doesn't we're not using the type requirements accordingly and so having a language feature it can actually analyze what type requirements you want analyze those type def definitions and ensure that your function actually met matches those type requirements 
The other thing you can do is you can do much more sophisticated um, type requirement checking. So right now, you can't really do any template-based type requirement checking in the current language. There is, um, there is a proposal for adding some kind of lift operator so, and, and possibly making it SFINA friendly. So you could check to see if a template, like for example, if a template member function exists, you could use it to check that only if it exists, but you can't check any requirements on that template member function. But having multi-phase checking, the same process we go through to check template definitions, we can use that same process to check uh, the uh, template-based type requirements. So we can get a much deeper level of type checking when we actually have a language feature. And then finally, concept mapping. That's some of the feature that's, that you can't get from a library approach. Um, of course, I think I think like Matt Calabresi has implemented some kind of boost generic library at one point that implemented uh, concept mapping. I don't know how sophisticated it was, but one important aspect about concept mapping is, you know, when you start making your libraries generic and meeting the requirements, you may have this legacy library over here that almost meets the type requirements, but not exactly. And so, concept mapping is something that's really useful for you know, okay, this almost meets the requirements, let's just concept map it so it does meet the requirements. So this is something really useful to have as well. And I think the best approach is the language, language support for being able to do that. So, and then finally, about the libraries. So the libraries are, have been tested on GCC 4.6 to 4.9. I haven't checked GCC 5, I think it's over 5.1. I think it's just come out recently. And it's been tested on Clang 3.4 and on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, these are the, uh, the URLs for the, the, the repos on GitHub for those who want to go in and grab it. Now, um, uh, it doesn't support Visual Studio, um, partly because um, both of these libraries require a lot on Expressions Finet. It might be possible to get fit to work Fit, the FIT library, when it uses expressions finet, is only for checking function callability. And there's a technique of using an implicit conversion of a, of a function pointer to actually check the callability of it. So it's possible FIT library could add support for Visual Studio. I don't know how solid Visual Studio, the latest version of Visual Studio are. So there could be a possibility for this in the future, but the TIG library wouldn't be possible without direct support for expressions finet. So. Any questions? Have you uh, measured the, the compile time penalty for using uh, tick? Uh, the compile time pen, pen, penalty for using tick, I haven't really measured it like in detail with it. Um, I've not seen a noticeable slowdown. Uh, the other thing is, is when you start checking traits like that, the, the compiler will actually you can get an improvement because the compiler short circuits that and stops compiling everything, the rest of the template definition. So sometimes you can get an improvement by using uh, traits, I do know. So. so according to your GitHub page, it is a C++ 11 library. Yes. Is there anything that would be improved by using C++ 14 in terms of syntax or user friendliness? Um, the question was, right now, currently, it says it's C++11 library, and if, if there would be improvements using uh, C++14 uh, features. Um, the, the library originally was a C++14, it was originally written as a C++14 library, and then I basically added in support for C++11. So I don't know if there's a lot of newer stuff that could be improved with it, um, since most of it is very basic. Uh, for some of the stuff for GCC 4.6, some of those examples, like using the returns, there's some macros to do some of that stuff to make it a little less verbose, because you have to do some extra stuff with GCC 4.6, because it doesn't support like template aliases and stuff. But the other features, um, I don't know if there's really much in C14 that would improve the tick library. Now, the fit library has features in it, even though it supports just C11, it has features in it that um, can benefit directly from C14 um, using it. Um, like I obviously saw there using those generic lambdas, those you can only do in C14. So, yeah. Is there any other questions? Are, are there any points in the library that would be related to runtime overhead? 
Okay, the question was, is there any points in the libra library that would be re uh, related to runtime overhead? Um, uh, which library are you, either like, one. either one? Well, the, the it's, okay, the tick library doesn't, um, it doesn't really do any runtime stuff at all. Now the fit library, because it does a lot of those abstractions, a lot of those are actually technically runtime, although you can use everything in, in a const expert, you can use const expert functions with it as well. But uh, a lot of times I found it very friendly for the optimizer, so they can optimize a lot of things and reduce a lot of things out. So usually you don't see the overhead of all the extra function calls that happen along the way. So. Uh, if I check the, the comparison of using the fixed point combinator using normal recursion, um, I've not checked the compile time performance of that. Mm -hmm. I, oh, the runtime performance? Okay, no, I've not checked the runtime performance of it. Because you're basically passing, you know, the, the this of the yourself, right? Mm -hmm. you write your lambda and you receive self is basically the this pointer of, of your uh, fix. Is that it? Kind of, it does some level stuff too, to, because you can't refer to yourself in 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 it. Um, I would, I would, yeah. I don't know. I have not measured the runtime performance of it to know in detail with that. There was probably no overhead, but it's just. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, any other questions? All right.